First of all, man, thank you so much uh, to be joined by Dolph Ziggler on Talk Wrestling this week. Always been a big Dolph guy, um, which I'm sure you you know from our last time speaking. Uh, and this Sunday at the horror show Extreme Rules, uh, you're going to be challenging for the WWE title against Drew McIntyre, a man that you've got a good history with that um, I feel has played into this story really well. Um, the first thing I've got to ask you, man, because everyone's asking it, and I know you're not really going to tell me, but I've got to ask it anyway. What is the deal with the stipulation, man? Uh, I mean, this is a pretty simple thing. Uh, he gave me the option to pick it. I don't want to pick any dumb thing that's ever been done before. But when I say, like, tables match, and he's just going to throw me through a table, like, how the hell does that help me? Uh, chairs match, you know, pick up three chairs and swing them at me and break me and have, like, how stupid would I be to one, I don't have to announce it. So why would I let him prepare? If you look at this as a sport, as I do, why would I let him prepare for it when he's clearly a, a, a million and O walking cyborg monster guy, especially over the last six months, year, why in the hell I, I need every possible little niche I can poke out and also being in his head to not let him know he has to prepare for everything and anything. And I know what it is. And if I get the lawyers to sign off on it, it is something that's never been done before. And I have a more than legitimate chance of becoming WWE champion on Sunday. That, uh, that's the cool thing, though, because I think a lot of people were like, oh, man, like, have they not even thought of the stipulation yet? But actually, it's the very opposite. You're being very meticulous and well thought I out. I assure doing. you, I have already thought of it. And it is this close to being... Uh, legalized and signed through before I bring it. I have to make sure it, it follows the WWE guidelines, but yeah. Okay, right. Well, while we look forward to that, let's talk about how we've got here. So when Drew obviously returned to the company, uh, when he started to retain great success was with yourself on the main roster, right? And you became tag champs. Um, you know, you set about to almost set a new standard on Monday nights for all the people that were kind of slacking. And, and now look at Drew, right? Like you said, last six months, been absolutely killing it. Um, talk to me about the man you saw return to the main roster, to the guy you're going to face this Sunday. Um, I, I really like, though, the, the last I saw him, I mean, we texted once in a while, but the last I saw of him is when he left. You know, it's really easy to forget about people. Um, so, I, I mean, there was occasional text, maybe one or two in a couple of years, but that was it. And then um, <clears throat> seeing him and seeing that he had changed, most importantly, his mindset. Uh, uh, we, uh, so many of us will probably say it, good guys or bad guys. We're lucky to be doing this. We're lucky to be here. There's a thousand people who want every single person's spot on this roster. And somehow we are here. And when you get past that, you go, how can I make this business better when I leave? Okay, here's what I can do. Here's how I can make my mark. Here's how I can walk back every night and face everybody and tell them to follow that. And he had this laser focused new mindset of maybe I don't get a third chance. Second time, I got to make this count. I got to make it count. I have to do everything in my power to be the best and give them no excuses to ever, for any reason, not give me the ball. And uh, he has dominated. He's rocked. He's done it. Uh, you know, I jumped on a bunch of grenades for the two of us when, uh, when we were tagging together. I would take the helms. I would jump in front of him and get blasted by somebody so we could get the win. But also, I guess it's a blessing and a curse how much of a team player I am. But uh, I knew what he wanted to do, and I knew a great introduction would be to be with me because I was lucky 15 years ago to uh, go up and down the roads with Chavo Guerrero as a caddy, even though I wasn't treated as anything other than some loser on the side. But I got to get that psychological game going very early on and learn from one of the greatest of all time. So to have that in my back pocket and now years later go, this guy could use a little bit of my psychological advan advantages and he is going to be unstoppable down the line. And he is. And, and that's the thing, right? So we're looking at it now and you've got him on Sunday. So it's, it's revitalizing in that aspect that, you know, it's a, a big career opportunity. You're, you know, fighting for a world title on pay-per-view. Um, but at the same time, being paired with him, for a guy like yourself that's done so much and you've been in WWE for so long, is that revitalizing in itself? Is it nice when those kind of opportunities come along, I guess? Um, I mean, yes and no. I, uh, I really like, um, I like taking control of a situation, but I also like being on my own. So 
at that time, I was like, ah, let's see how this goes. But it, the, the, the way you, um, the people behind the scenes see me is if I had someone giant in my back pocket or watching my back, then maybe I could be a little bit in more important matches. Maybe I am a, a title contender. So I enjoyed that aspect of it. I enjoyed, like I said a million times, his laser focus. He wanted to learn. He wanted to be the best. and wanted to leave everyone behind him. And I said, this is fantastic. What a great partnership. So that in that uh, context, we made it work great, and uh, it worked out really well. Like I said, I was jumping on grenade after grenade and taking uh, the shrapnel in my back. But long term, it was for the best. It gave me something different to do. It gave me someone uh, where I can – we looked out for each other, and we could make some different things happen because you can't just be, hi, I'm Dolph. I'm awesome at my job. But for some reason, I lose 90% of the time. Anyway, I'm going to be around for 15 years. That's not how it works. You got to change up the character, your character, change up your mindset, change up your goals, different things. So then going after tag titles, fighting the shield, beating them up and going, this is a new layer to where we can make some more credibility here for everybody. Absolutely. And yeah, I'm looking forward to Sunday just because I know above all else, it's going to be a good match with those who are involved. Um, but I do want to quickly talk about you made the switch from SmackDown. It seemed like there was some stuff for you there. And I just, just want to pick your brain about it quick. It seems like a lot of people enjoyed the um, the chemistry between yourself and Sonya Deville. That didn't really get. I know that the primary purpose of the story, you know, Mandy and Otis, and then you know, against yourself and Sonya, and how all that played out. But I think that was a cool side story that maybe could have been explored more. That is that something that you felt and, and you saw? Have you seen the reaction? Because that's a a lot of fans I saw were talking about that. Yeah, I, I really it was. Um... Sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. And sometimes you make it happen eventually over a few months. But right off the bat, we had chemistry to where it worked. And if this was, you know, a year ago and it was pre-COVID times and we were doing live events five nights a week and getting even more chemistry, we would have been this back and forth, just giving each other a look and knowing where the other one was going. Uh, but it was a really cool uh, group. And like all together, Otis has something special going on. Otis and Mandy together are something special. Otis and Mandy versus Sonia and myself is some special relationship to where that really could have gone on for a long time, but it's show business. And sometimes it's like this and they're going somewhere else and you go time to adjust and see what the hell I'm doing. Uh, uh, we really uh, hit it off. All, all three of them in that group aside from myself were they're young up and comers and they all wanted to things to be great. They all wanted to dig their teeth and nails in and go, how can this be better? How can this be great? How can I? And Sonia was like, how can I punch her in the face like this? And I'm like, let's get it. It was to see that in their eyes made it so much better. I'm like, they want to make something special here. They're not just thrown in this group. So it it really could have been a long-term thing. And I said this a little bit earlier today. I just pictured long-term Sonia and myself, whenever we talked, we only had a couple of weeks of it. And it was just like, you could just feel it between us and that we had this goal and there was something special there happening. And uh, I just kept picturing, I go look down the road, myself, Bobby Roode and Sonia coming out in black tie and suit shades on and all the titles on our shoulders. And I go, this is something that could be special. And we never got to do it though. But that's, I mean, that's life and show business. Never say never, man. I'd like to see that. I would like to see that. Um, I mean, the other thing with SmackDown as well was uh, with John Morrison returning, um, you know, and obviously a lot of people were like, oh, maybe he'll team up with Miz. And he did. You were there on SmackDown at the time, it, known to be good friends with both of them. Was there ever the thought to maybe say, hey, I wouldn't mind being a part of that? Um, I mean, I, don't, I mean, maybe if I owned the company and I were like, <laughs> well, okay. uh, I mean. my friends are here, I'm going to go be their team. And yeah. then, you know, uh, but that's not how it works. But, uh, but there was, uh, I mean, there was a handful of times where we were working together. We were in a six man tag. We did a couple backstage okay. things. So there's, I mean, this is really easy to just turn into a team like that. And, mm. um, uh, as usual, there's other things going on, other factors. And when the goal is something else, you go, okay, we just showed you the chemistry we have or what we can do here. No problem. Go do your thing. And, Oh, and it's one of those things where maybe we go back to it uh, and we can't. And we, in one day we did like a two minute thing where we talked to each other and then we were just a, a, a six man team and we were tagging and laughing. And I go, this is the first day I go, this is something that can be so easily special without us even knowing. Mm. And uh, so maybe we'll go back to it one day. I, w- I would love that. Now I've spoken to guys in interviews recently uh, where your names come up totally unprompted and. Uh-oh. <laughs> Yeah, no, in good ways, in very good ways. So the, the first one was 
I was speaking to Eric Bischoff, and we, he, I was talking about if he could start a company, who would be the one guy he would do it with? And, and, and you were his first pick. Of anyone, you were his first pick, right? Wow. Um, and I spoke to Ric Flair, and we were talking about who was the best in the world, and you know, a la Randy Orton and whatnot. Uh, and he said, Dolph Ziggler is absolutely in that conversation, um, you know, because you can do a bit of everything. Same things that the Bischoff said, to be honest. You know, you, you can be serious, you can be funny, you've got a great look, great work, all of that stuff. Um, and I think the other thing Ric Flair always says is that you could tie people in knots. That's his favourite line. I'm sure he said that to me like three times. Um, well, he makes a good point. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I guess the point I'm arriving at, these are, you know, that both of them anyway are very nice names to hear that from. But that seems to be a common thought in the business. Uh, so certainly, as I've said before, I'm a big fan. Do you get kind of, you know, in terms of the accolades that you want, is there a disparity there, like between who, you know, you'd probably want Vince McMahon saying those things or whoever it might be. Do, do you ever feel like there's a disparity between the perception of you, which is a really, really good one from pretty much anyone you speak to, to the success that you believe you should have attained? I know that's a really convoluted question. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I get what you're saying. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, hey, too bad. Too bad Bischoff and Flair don't own the company because <laughs> then maybe I would be the Randy Orton. Uh, mm. But that's, I mean, that's like, that's how it goes. Uh, too bad it's not 1997 and I would go down to Atlanta and say, you know, let, let's reform NWO. Um, hearing that from them is fantastic. Uh, Bischoff has a, a amazing businessman mind for the business. If you listen to him talk, he, he knows facts. He knows what really happened. He knows the business aspect behind the camera, in front of the camera. Ric Flair, one of the greatest of all effing time and a friend of mine. I love him. Uh, to get that praise from him, it will never, ever get old because I see him as one of the greatest that have ever done it. And he's still going today. He's going to outlive us all somehow. <laughs> and he's still – and the last few weeks, because we've been in Orlando, I've had a chance to hang out with him, uh, you know, and have a couple uh, soda pops after the, after the shows. And it is my absolute favorite thing to do. Um, those two who – it kills me that – when you know there's legends in the business and your name is always in a short list and you're not necessarily thought of that way at your job, uh, kills me every single day. Uh, but I find a way to defend it by, if I have five minutes, go make this the best five minutes there is. And then one day I'll be like, hey, listen, I'm done. I'm not coming back anymore. And they're like, oh no, well we need you for the next 10 years. And you go, well, you know, uh, we, you should have listened to uh, Bischoff and Flair. No, I'm just mm. kidding. But it's, uh, but it's one day uh, you have to be gone for them to notice what they're missing. And I'm rarely ever freaking gone. So uh, at some point, um, at some point it'll be, you, you, you'll find out how needed you are. But I'm not there yet. I, I, I still love doing what I do. I, I love hearing that praise because it's stuff like that that keeps you going from the people that you look up to. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing, like, when I was chatting to Flair about that, um, and we were sort of, you know, riffing on the idea that, you know, you've got those state records and things as an amateur wrestler, and, you know, very decorated. Has there ever been the thought to, uh, and, and I know the answer will probably be that they didn't want to do it or whatever, and you don't make those decisions, but even from your own perspective, for your character to more closely reflect that, like a serious... Uh, I don't want to call it a shooter, but you know what I mean, like an a, 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 a amateur one, wrestling kind of One time, a long time ago, I was told the reason I'm not credible for world championships is 10 years ago, maybe longer, whatever. The reason I'm not credible enough to be winning world championships is because of my hair. Not that I get beat up, not that I lose every match, not that I don't talk. It was because my blonde hair so it got cut short and dyed black and I was serious and I went out there and beat the hell out of Santino and it was the dumbest thing I've ever done. I <laughs> didn't want to do it. I go, this isn't me. We can find a way to uh, introduce more of my back, my shooting background into some things. Nope. Here's what they wanted. And after three weeks, they said, uh, oh, our bad. So, um, I, I can't begin to dissect that, by the way. <laughs> like, yeah, what was I, it? The, the color, the length? Like, I, I don't understand. Like, there's been plenty. I don't know. I don't know. So, I, I go, but it, it, it's sometimes people don't see, uh, like, oh, like maybe if I just, I don't know, 
beat some people up sometimes or won a couple matches or talked or or talked like I am right now and got to defend myself like, hey, I should be out here tying people in knots, winning world titles, getting on the microphone, hopping on a jet, getting down, doing a press conference, and strutting away with Ric Flair. And they go, yeah, but I don't know. We should just cut your hair. So, I mean, that uh, I tried to get out of it as much as I could. But uh, sadly, um, I guess that's the vision that they have. So you have to go with that and go try and fight them every single day. And I fight the good fight behind the scenes and in the ring every damn day. Well, a good fight is coming this Sunday. And uh, as, as, a fight, yeah. as a fight of both, uh, as a fight, as a fan of both you and Drew, I am excited to see what you guys can put on. Uh, and especially what this stipulation is going to be. So you've got me hook, line, and sinker, Dolph. I'm really looking forward to it, man. I'm glad because uh, if you watch the show, you'd think I'd have no chance. But knowing that I, knowing that I have this stipulation that I'm saying, and I, it's 99% all the way through, it will be, I'll be disappointed if I don't walk out of their WWE champion. Sorry, Drew. You had a hell of a run. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Dolph. Thank you for joining Talk Wrestling, man. You got it.